very thankful for God's amazing grace today. It was God's amazing grace that sent his only begotten son to live a life on this earth and to die a cruel, harsh, horrific death on the cross for you and for me. As she was talking about the forgiveness of our sin and the overcoming of our hurt, I don't know if you can relate to this, but God had to forgive me of a lot of sin. And there's still times in my life that I need the grace of God to forgive me of my shortcomings. Amen? There's still seasons that I go through in this life of bitterness and hurt and pain and suffering that I have to go back to the cross and say, Jesus, I need you now more than ever. I I need Jesus more today than I did yesterday. There's bigger problems, there's bigger trials, there's bigger things that I have to face. But that is the hope of the gospel this morning. And we have a lot of visitors here. Some of you all sneak into church a couple of times a year. Let's give them all a hand. We're glad you're here. There was a pastor standing at the back of the church one time on on Easter Sunday and and some people filed by and the pastor said, you know what, Jimmy, I I haven't seen you all year. And he said, well, I come on Christmas and I come on Easter. And the pastor said, well, you're part of the secret service then, aren't you? (laughs) But I'm glad you're here this morning. We have been praying for you. I want you to know that. The elders, the pastors, the leaders of this church have been praying specifically for every single person that has walked into this door this morning, has walked into this room this morning. We, We prayed for you. I don't believe it's an accident that you're here this morning. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe that God has you here for a purpose and he wants you to hear something straight from him. He he wants you to apply something to your heart. We all have shortcomings. We all go through seasons of dryness. We all go through seasons of despair. And you're at the right place because Jesus is the answer for whatever question mark you may have in this life. Jesus is always the answer. And today, of course, is Easter Resurrection Sunday. And we're excited that you chose to worship here as we worship a risen Savior. I'm glad my God is still alive. I'm glad my my Jesus is not dead. He rose from the grave. And I'm glad that he's coming back to take us all out of this mess someday. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. People get ready. It's coming soon. Sooner than yesterday. It's coming soon. There is a time when the skies will split and Jesus will come to take us all home. We're going to dive right into scripture this morning. We're going to focus on the two criminals on the cross this morning. We've been in a series called the Red Letter Reflections, and we're looking at the dialogue, the comments, the words that Jesus uttered from the cross. There there were seven statements that he proclaimed from the cross. Six hours in the crucifixion. Seven different statements that we have in our word that we've been breaking apart And today we're going to look at one of those phrases, and I want to dive right into Luke chapter 23, verse 33. If you got your Bibles, Luke 23, there there are Bibles in the front, in some of the bottom sections of your seats. You can pull those out. I, I love to hear the pages of God's Word turning in the sanctuary. That's music to a pastor's ear right there. And you might have it on your app. That's fine. Get your, get your phone out. Get your Bible app out. But if we catch you on Facebook, an usher going to come and ask you to leave, all right? <laughs> Some of you all trick us. You get on there, you start scrolling through social media. I wonder what's going on in the world. No, let's focus on what's going on in the Word of God. Let's focus on the Bible. Luke 23, verse 33, when they came to a place called the skull, Calvary, Golgotha. They nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. We're going to focus on these two gentlemen this morning. And really, there's not much we know about these two criminals. And and we can kind of imagine what their life was like, kind of imagine what took place in their world. And I, I don't know where they came from. We don't know how old they were. We we don't know what they looked like. We don't know what they sounded like. We don't know how they lived. We don't even know what their crime was that they committed. But both criminals in that moment 
had an opportunity to encounter Jesus, the living Son of God. Think about the power of that moment as two criminals, clueless of their surroundings, are like, I think we're hanging next to somebody that's pretty important. I think this is a big deal. I don't know if they could imagine that, hey, this might be a history-changing moment right here. We better hold on and see what's going on. But both criminals had an encounter with Jesus. I want you to know this morning that both criminals hanging on the cross reacted with bitterness and insults. Both of them, the one on the left, the one on the right, they both mocked the Son of God throughout Scripture. Both criminals challenged Jesus to save himself, if you remember the story. But there was one criminal, there was one thief that got a glimmer of hope. There there was one criminal hanging there that began to think about his life and began to think about the shortness of life and he began to think about eternity and he began to wonder to himself, maybe there is something to this Jesus guy that is hanging next to me. Maybe I need to pay attention. And he engaged in a short, powerful conversation that transformed his eternity forever. A short conversation. I tell you what, if you will encounter Jesus even for one second, if all you can get is the hem of his garment, if all you can do is barely get into the vicinity of his presence, everything can change for you. It's that simple. There's power in Jesus that goes beyond. You don't have to have a big prayer. You don't have to clean up your life and then come to Jesus. You don't have to have an hour with him, friend. If you stand one second in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you will be different and you will be changed if you allow him into your heart. But this repentant thief looked at Jesus. And I want you to imagine this moment All he said was, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's the only thing he said to the Son of God. Hey, when you get up to heaven, when you get up to wherever you're going, don't forget me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in that powerful moment, that life-changing moment, that transformative moment, We see Jesus, who is the embodiment of that grace that we just watched on the video. That amazing grace, that compassion, with tears in his eyes and with blood flowing from him and with all the pain that he had endured, he paused in another interruption of his life to look out for someone else. That's the power of Jesus this morning. He is a God of interruptions. And I know you have interrupted God a lot in your journey. You have taken detours. You've taken wrong turns. And Jesus has been there every single time for you. And this criminal interrupted him. And by worldly standards, this man deserved death. This man deserved punishment. This man was going through what he should have been going through in that time, in that law, in that age, and in that culture. But friend, today Jesus showed some astonishing love. Are you thankful for the love of God? Are you thankful for the love of Jesus? And he showed this display of love and he responded with words that will forever echo throughout history. These words are life-changing words. And when you are saved and whenever Jesus comes into your heart, whenever you accept and believe and confess, whatever that looks like, these words can be spoken to you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. There's power in that. Friend, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I believe that there is eternal security and that someday you will be with Jesus forever in paradise. Someday you will cross over into heaven. Someday you will be reunited with the one that died for you. And I want to run through heaven when I get there. And I want to fall at the feet of Jesus. And I want to look at the nail scars and prints in his hands and his feet. And I want to thank him for what he did on the cross for me. You may be better than me. You may be better behaved and better off. And maybe you have a better past than I do. But friend, I'm unworthy this morning. I'm undeserving of the love of God. 
I didn't deserve what he did for me on that cross. Can you relate to that this morning? Or is everybody holy and righteous and pious this morning? Do you need a Jesus? Do you need a savior? Are you glad that he died for you this morning? Is anybody awake this morning? Is he alive? Come on. Y'all sitting there like we're at a funeral. He didn't die and stay dead. Three days later, he busted out of that tomb. You can walk by and see the grave of Buddha. You can walk by and see the grave of Hare Krishna. You can walk by and see the grave of all these other men that they have said are great prophets and are gods. But you walk by the tomb that was borrowed from Joseph. It's empty. There ain't no body. There ain't no bones. There ain't no shrouds. There's nothing left because he busted out of that grave for you and for me. We're getting a little excited this morning. Today you will be with me in paradise. And with these words, there was boundless love, boundless mercy and grace that flowed from the cross. I like to challenge people whenever I preach. I I like to comfort the afflicted and I like to afflict the comfortable. Is that all right? So if you're comfortable this morning, I'm gonna make you a little uncomfortable. I want you to do this little initiative with me this morning. And I'm gonna ask you a question. On a scale of one to 100, how good of a person are you? Mm. Some of y'all are like, I think we came to the wrong church for Easter, honey. (laughs) It's too late to leave, we've locked the doors. So get comfortable. We're here for another three hours. Put your Easter dinner off. Who cares about ham, yams, and whatever else you're going to have? On a scale of 1 to 100, how good of a person are you? Do you have a number in mind? Let me help you. One is the lowest. (laughs) Just helping you out here. One is creepy, weirdo, freak, loser, downright sinner. So if you said one, you might want to readjust that, okay? Because I would pray that there's no ones in here, okay? I think we got a better church than that. So if you're one, give yourself a 10. Just kind of give yourself some time here. On the other hand, if you're 100, that's perfect, just like your pastor. So <laughs> go ahead and proclaim that. Praise Jesus. We're, we're 100. No, 100 is basically God himself. So do you have a number in mind? All right, turn to your neighbor and tell him. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. (laughs) Some of you are all like, this is going to be weird because I'm a 10. (laughs) How good of a person are you? From 1 to 100, do you have that in mind? If you're between 1 and 30, sit tight. The ushers are going to come and get you and have you leave the church, okay? And if you're between 80 and 100, you're probably lying to yourself. You need to repent for lying, and we'll have an altar call here at the end. Some of y'all never been to a church with an altar call. That's a place where we stand up here and say, you need to get saved and come down here now. One to 100, how good of a person are you? And I'm sorry we're being a little goofy this morning. We like to have fun here at Family Worship Center. Is that all right? Thanks for the 30 people clapping. Whenever we compare ourselves to other people, you're either going to feel really good about yourself or you're going to feel really bad about yourself. If you're sitting next to somebody that you're sure is a 10, boy, you're going to feel good. (laughs) I'm a lot better than her. I'm better off than him. And if you compare yourself to a murderer, oh, I'm perfect. I'm better off than that. But then if I say compare yourself to Billy Graham, hmm, I think we're a little lower, right? The truth this morning is we can't compare ourselves to each other. We have to compare ourselves to the word of God. We have to compare ourselves to Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We have to find our answers in the Bible this morning. I don't look at you and say, well, I need to live more like you. I need to be more like you. I need to own what you have. I need to do what you do. We can have mentors and we can learn from people. But friend, today, we have to keep our focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. And if we dig back into the word of God, Luke chapter 23, verse 32, it said that there were two criminals who were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Would you agree with me this morning as we just did that scale from 1 to 100? 
that these criminals were probably 1 through 25. Would you agree? Scripture tells us they were pretty bad guys. They, they weren't very good men. And so I would say, by all accounts, that these two criminals were not good people. They were bad. They were considered the lowest in society. And in that culture, I want you to know that crucifixion was a common way to execute people. I think sometimes we think that they just did that to Jesus. No, this was a common practice of execution for the lowlifes. Normally not for the Romans, but normally for the slaves and the ones that were non-Romans, this was punishment. This was for the criminals and the slaves. In fact, one of the world's leading authorities on the subject of crucifixion estimates that between around 200 B.C. and A.D. 337, somewhere between 100 and 150,000 people were crucified. 100 to 150,000 people were crucified. And crucifixion was reserved for the lowlifes. Crucifixion was meant to, to embarrass the person, to shame the person. It was one of the lowest ways for a person to go out of this world. It was a way that they lost their dignity. And they were mocking Jesus. You say you're the king of the Jews, we're going to crucify you. You say you're the king of the Jews, we're going to shove a crown on your head, but it's going to be made of thorns and it's going to hurt going down. They wanted to shame Jesus and torture him. And scripture goes on to say in Luke chapter 23, 39, one of the criminals who hung there gave insults towards him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And that's when he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And the response that Jesus gives in this moment, it really will challenge the modern day Pharisees. This next statement stirs up the legalistic people in the church. We can't wrap our mind around this whole scenario. We, we can't picture this because we think God is up here and we're way down here and we've got to do all of this different stuff to get to God. Friends, you don't have to do anything to get to God. He's right there. All you've got to do is call on his name and he will be there for you every single time to save you, deliver you, to help and to heal and Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Powerful statement. I want you to know that this criminal didn't do anything right. This criminal couldn't do anything right. This criminal by all accounts was bad. He was a lowlife. He was the scum of the earth. He, he couldn't even make his sins right. This criminal couldn't crawl down off the cross to make restitution to the people that he stole from and hurt. He, he couldn't do anything right. And Jesus still said, think about this. I'm going to say that again. In spite of all of that, Jesus still said, today you will be with me in paradise. Boy, that's powerful today, church, to think of the love, grace, and mercy of our Jesus. One of the biggest misunderstandings in the American church today is this fact that good people go to heaven. Culture says good people go to heaven. And I want you to listen to me. And I want you to hear this this morning. We're going to preach for one second. Good works, baptism, church attendance, your religion, your good behavior, your Sunday school attendance, your charity, your money, your communion, your positive thinking, the political party you belong to, how good you portray yourself out in public, who you really think you are and how righteous and holy and pious you are will not get you into heaven. Just being good and following the law will not get you into heaven. Just pretending to be a good Christian will not get you into heaven. Just doing the motions and saying that I am who I say I am will not get you into heaven. 
Good people do not get into heaven just for being good because Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the answer. You can't save yourself. That criminal on the cross could not save himself. You know, and that's what really trips up the legalistic people of the church because in our mind, well, he didn't say the sinner's prayer. He didn't get baptized. He didn't do this. He didn't do that, friend. All he did was believe in the Son of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. And here is what I want you to hear this morning. Whoever believes in him, oh, shall not perish but have eternal life. It's that belief. It's that easy. We complicate it. Well, you got to be a good person. Yeah, you get saved and God will let you do some good works and you will do good works because of the difference and the change that he has brought into your life. But all of this stuff that we get worried about in the church and we start to judge other people for will not save you. Jesus is your salvation. And he is your focus this morning. I want you to get ready to have your mind blown this morning. Can we do that real quick? We're about done. I'm halfway through. I know some of you are getting nervous because your crock pot's on. Just hold on. We're going to get you there. It's Easter. we got to see the Easter buddy. Let me tell you what, friend. I'm here to see Jesus. <laughs> He's the one that saved me. And I'm not against the Easter bunny. We had an Easter egg hunt last weekend. Why would we do that? To bring people to Jesus. Did you know we gave away... Eight or nine different bicycles to kids in the community that didn't have a bike through that event. Praise God for that. I tell you, we'll do anything short of sin to get people to Jesus. We will. That's what the church needs to be doing. You got to go to where they're at. They're not going to come to you. They want to see something different than hate and negativity and judgment. The world's full of that. The news is full of that. Politics is full of that. They want to see a church that's making a difference through love, grace, and mercy. And letting people know what you're doing is not right. We don't approve of your sin, but we will accept you right where you're at. And we will help walk you through this journey and through this life. But I want you to have your mind blown this morning, and you've probably heard this. But here is the pinnacle point of today's sermon. Good people do not go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. That man was not good. I wasn't good. There's still times in my journey I'm not good. And I know you're sitting there thinking, he's a pastor and he's saying that? I'm being transparent with you. Every single one of us in this room have had moments where we're not entirely good. In big ways, small ways, and I'm not justifying sin. I'm not saying come to Jesus and live any way you want. But let me tell you what, just being good will not get you into heaven. You have to be forgiven of your sin to have eternal security in Jesus Christ. There is a Jesus that died on the cross for you so that you can overcome your sin. So that you can say, Jesus, take my past and throw it into the depths of the ocean, never to be remembered against me again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, you become a new creation through Jesus Christ. Forgiven people come to the place where they say, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with all of you other misfits. Someday the plan is going to be perfected and we're going to live forever. I'm going to find me a piano and you all come around. You guys will have angelic voices, I bet. You come around that piano and we'll sing some of these old songs that we sang down here on earth and we will rejoice with some of the men and women from the Bible. Can you imagine that? We will rejoice with our grandma and grandpas and aunts, uncles, mama, daddies, whoever has passed and gone on before us that was a believer in Jesus. We will rejoice around the throne with them someday. 
That's the hope of the gospel. None of us are good. Scripture says that God alone is good. And I want to quickly pull two things from the forgiven criminal that we can apply to our hearts and to our life today. The first one, the forgiven one admits wrong. The forgiven one admits they're wrong. You see, many individuals, they try to rationalize their sin in today's world. They try to justify their sin and make an excuse for it and and say, this is why I do what I do. And we love comparing ourselves to the people who commit the big, well-known sins. We like to say, my sin isn't as big as his sin, so I'm good. No, sin is sin in the eyes of God. Sin separates from God. There is no fellowship between the light and the darkness. When measured against God's standards, nobody can claim to be truly righteous or truly good this morning. The Bible is clear in James chapter 2, verse 10, when it says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Have you ever heard that verse? I'm keeping the whole law. That makes me good, Pastor. Yeah, but if you break one, the Bible says you're guilty of breaking all of them. Woo. Well, how do we remain good? How do we remain saved? How do we keep the faith? Friend, we keep our focus on Jesus. He's the bridge. He's our righteousness. He was the perfect sacrifice for your sin. That's the beauty of the cross. It doesn't matter on the good scale, like we said, 1 to 100. If you're a 15, if you're 38, if you're 74, maybe some of you all thought I'm a 99.999% good person. I don't care where you are on that scale. Every single one of us falls short of the glory of God. Every single one of us are in need of a Jesus every single day. And if you got saved and that's the only Jesus you got, friends, you're missing out. I've got a Jesus that walks with me and talks with me and a comforter, the Holy Spirit. We're getting into that next week. Come back. It's going to be good. He left the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to lead, guide, and direct us. Scripture even hits this point home in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. In the eyes of God. And I don't want to confuse you this morning. I I want you to know that when you get saved, there is a change in your life. But I also want you to know, quit letting the enemy defeat you every single day and put you down because you made a mistake. Because all you got to do is point back to the cross and say, remember that devil? Remember whenever you had to go back to hell with your tail tucked between your legs, huh? You remember that? Do you remember whenever he got the keys and he locked the gates and broke them so that we could all have eternal life? Do you remember that he cursed you back to hell and you are defeated and you have no power? You got to say that to the devil every single day. I've got a Jesus that forgives me. We're like filthy rags whenever we try to be good. Good does not save us. Our works do not save us. Being holy, righteous, and pious does not save us. Jesus is the only way for you to have salvation this morning. Isn't that good news? And after the forgiven criminal admits his wrong, here's the second thing he does. The forgiven criminal doesn't just admit that he's wrong. The forgiven criminal asks for eternal help. He says, I'm wrong, and then he says, will you remember me whenever you go into eternity? Can I tag along with you? Because I don't want to go to the other place. Can you give me that unlimited grace and mercy? Can I have a taste of that? And I want you to know a powerful thought in all of this. Both of the criminals asked Jesus for help. As you read that, you see that both criminals asked Jesus for help. The first criminal said... Jesus, if you are Christ, if you are the Son of God, save yourself, and hey, while you're at it, save me too. See, the first criminal asked for help. If you are who you say you are, save yourself and save me. If you're there, make my life better, make this easier. Give me a hall pass, give me a ticket out of this place. 
But the difference is the second criminal asked for eternal help. The first criminal was selfish. Save me so I can go back down to this earth and live the way that I've been living. Save me so I can get off of this cross and still be a criminal. The second criminal got it. And he said, hey, don't just save me. Take me to heaven. (laughs) Don't just save me. Remember me whenever you get up there, wherever it is. You remember me. Both thieves were guilty. Both thieves were suffering greatly. Both were dying. Both needed a savior. Both witnessed the exact same events and heard Jesus say the exact same words. But at the end of the day, one was forgiven and one was not. They both had the same encounter with Jesus. And one got it and one did not. And here's the reality on this Easter Sunday as we get ready to close in just a minute. You are one of the two thieves. You are one of the two criminals this morning hanging beside Jesus. You've had the same encounters. You've heard the same Bible verses. You've heard the truth. You felt conviction in your heart. You've had Jesus speak to you. You've had the Holy Spirit minister to you and convict you. You are one of the two thieves. And I want to encourage you this morning. I know some of you are going to leave here and say, I'm a 35. That must be pretty rotten in Brad's standards. Listen, I, I don't care if you're one to 100. I don't care where you fall on that scale. It doesn't matter what number you are with Jesus. He will always make up the difference. With Jesus, every single person that knows him and believes in him and has confessed and walks with him is a hundred. Why? Because of the cross. He takes the deficit and he pays into it, the debt that we owe that we could never pay. And he says, I don't care if you're an 82. Here's the missing 18. I don't care if you're 12. Here's the missing 88. You're now a hundred. You're now a hundred because of Jesus and his blood and his righteousness and his holiness. Are you glad he makes up the difference this morning? Oh, thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die so that we don't have to come cleaned up. We don't have to come good. We don't have to come with it all together. We have to come broken and say, Jesus, only you can restore. Only you can give us hope. Here's the good news of the gospel, Romans 3, verse 21. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, like we said, Moses lived 1,300 years before Jesus died. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? We're not made right with God by our works or how good we are. There's a byproduct of doing good works in a life that's changed after we find Jesus. But friend, today we are only made holy and right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. And I want you to hear this today, no matter who you are. You might be here this morning, I've done terrible things. Welcome to Family Worship Center. You're in the right place. We've had people come into this building saying the roof is gonna fall in. It's still standing. Some of y'all this morning told someone, I haven't been in church in a long time. I don't, listen, I don't care who you are. Jesus still died for you right where you are. He's still on your side and for you and not against you and calling you to him this morning faith in Christ not works it's not about our religious activity it's not about joining a church it's not about being good enough it's not about getting everything right it's not about how many scriptures we know our salvation comes from our hope and trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone this morning I want you to consider this the forgiven criminal on the cross couldn't do any good works His hands were literally bound to the cross. He couldn't get off that cross and do anything good to earn the love of Jesus. He couldn't go to the soup kitchen and serve food. He couldn't go and and help people. He was bound to the cross. 
He couldn't turn over a new leaf. His feet was nailed to the cross. This guy couldn't give any money to some organization. He didn't have a wallet on the cross. He couldn't start over and promise to live differently. He didn't get baptized. He didn't speak in tongues. He didn't seek restitution with all the other individuals that had hurt him and wronged him. He didn't memorize any scripture or sing a worship song. He didn't do anything good to earn the love and grace and mercy of Jesus. But Jesus still looked on with him and to him with compassion and said, I'll make up the deficit. I'll make up the difference. That's how much I love you. You don't have to be good. You have to be forgiven to have eternal life. And I pray as you stand this morning that we can seek Jesus with all of our heart on this Easter Sunday. And if you are on the scale of one to 100 and you need to measure up or change or grow, I tell you, friend, just ask Jesus to help. Ask Jesus to come down into your heart. 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new life. He's given us a new birth. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Friend, we have hope today because of the resurrection. We have faith today because Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he's coming back for us someday. The forgiven criminal said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked on with compassion to that dying, worthless, undeserving, dirty criminal and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. We're just going to get real for a quick moment this morning. I feel led to do this. If you need to accept Jesus Christ and believe on him and confess your sins this morning, maybe you did it as a kid and you're just not sure that you're 100% good with God, Maybe you've never done it. Maybe you've never been in church. Maybe this is a weird, bizarre thing, but you're feeling something deep down in your heart. I want to offer salvation to you today. I want to offer what Jesus did on the cross for you. If that's you this morning, would you just lift up your hand right where you're at? Nobody looking around. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Nineteen. The Jesus I serve will meet you right where you're at. He will forgive you of your sin. He will take away your past and your hurt, your brokenness, your baggage whatever separating you from God and he will make up the deficit and he will make you good and in right standing with him only because of his blood. For those 19 people, I want you to pray this in your heart and I want everybody in this room to repeat with me so they're not isolated. We're one. Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. I accept you. I believe in you. I confess my sin. I believe you died. I believe you rose again. I believe you're coming back. Forgive me, Father. Come into my heart. Make me a new creation. The old gone. The new come. In your name, amen. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate 19 souls making a commitment this morning on Easter Sunday, a day that you'll never forget, a day that will change your life forever.